Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call this September 14th electronic hybrid regular school board meeting to order. Um, Ms. Cadell, can you call the roll? Yes. Dr. Anderson? Here. Ms. Downs? Here. Mr. Henderson? Here. Ms. Litton? Here. Mr. Reitinger? Here. And Dr. Ruiz Bolanos? Here. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ms. Cadell. Can I have everybody stand to join me for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, can I have a motion to adopt the agenda? Dr. Anderson. Chair Litton, I move that the board adopt the agenda as presented. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Do we have a second? Second. Uh, thank you, Mr. Reitinger. Ms. Goodell, yes. can we call the roll? Dr. Anderson? Yes. Dr. Dimmick? I'm sorry, she's not. Ms. Downs? Yes. Mr. Henderson? Yes. Ms. Litton? Yes. Mr. Reitinger? Yes. And Dr. Ruiz Bolanas? Yes. Thank you. Great, thank you, Ms. Goodell. All right, to get us started this evening, I believe we have a team FCCPS spotlight and I will turn it over to Dr. Noonan. Thank you, Chair Litton. Good evening, everybody. So great to see all of you online and in person. Um, today marks uh, the sort of middle of the third week of school and we're very excited to be back uh, and rolling. Um, this evening, um, what we'd like to do is share with you an opening day report that we have um, traditionally done. Um, it's got some info, mostly pictures, a lot of pictures um, of the first days of school, um, but also share with you kind of where we are in terms of um, some of our uh, enrollment numbers and then answer any questions that you may have about the opening of school. Um, so I'm going to ask Kristen Michael if she could project the uh, presentation. Um, when it comes up on the screen, I want to um, just remind the board and everybody in the community that this year we really have tried to adopt um, the theme of roots, resilience, and renewal. And I want to take just a second and sort of um, describe why we have selected that as the, the major theme for the year. Um, roots really is about going, getting back to what, what we're really good at. Um, we have been in the fog, I think, of COVID for the last 18 or 20 months um, when we saw it coming and were able to respond to it. And uh, I had an opportunity to meet with, um, and I've told some of you the story, but I had a chance to do, have an opportunity to meet with the administrative team at my house a week before we closed school in March of 2020. Um, and when we were sitting at the house, we were um, doing a lot of work that was extraordinarily strategic about teaching and learning, um, looking at the IB program and progressing forward with the work that we had built on for the previous year and a half, two years. And unfortunately, all of that work sort of came to a screeching halt um, and we got into crisis mode. And so for the last 18 months, we've been sort of putting out fires and working through the pandemic and making sure everyone is safe. And I would submit to you that we're not out of the pandemic, obviously. We wanna make sure everybody continues to get vaccinated, continues to um, show good, good uh, mitigation strategies. But the, the point of that story is that as we um, come into this school year, this school year fares, feels very different to us than last year did insofar as we know what mitigation strategies there are, what we're using in our schools, how they work. We know how to contact trace better. Um, we know that the vaccine rate in the city of Falls Church is really high. So we really see an opportunity for us to really get back to our roots and to really think about what makes the city of Falls Church schools great. How do we leverage that? What is our quote unquote hedgehog? What is the thing that we do really, really well that we can continue to push on to help us move forward? So that's where the roots comes from. The resilience um, and, and the, the roots are represented by the trees, by the way. And so at convocation three years ago, I showed um, the, the redwoods of, of California and they're really shallow roots that grow together and they grow together and they, they don't tip over and they don't tip over because they hold together through their really shallow roots. This year at the end of convocation, I showed a tree that was like bent over almost in half from wind and fire but it hadn't fallen and it hadn't snapped. And so um, the point of that was that, you know, as a team, we can take on just about, just about anything. 
um, and have been able to move through that. So that's represented by trees. The resilience is represented by the deer. And some of you might wonder why a deer, we don't quite get that. And some of you might not know, but the white-tailed deer is perhaps one of the most resilient creatures in North America. So when we were thinking about resilience, sort of in the theme of sustainability, we looked up animals that would be good representations of resilience. And it was either a deer, a cockroach, or a tick. And so we decided that we'd go with a deer just because we thought it looked a little bit nicer. Um, but the deer represents resilience. And that's really meant to show that through all of the, the period of time that we've gone through for the last 18 or 20 months, as a team, we've really shown resilience. And yes, we, we've experienced loss. And yes, we've experienced pain. Um, we've experienced um, all of that together as a community. But as we move forward in 21, 22, we're, we're gonna come out of this and we're gonna come out of it in a very strong position um, and in a way that uh, hopefully makes us even better as a community. And the last is renewal. And that kind of gets back to our roots a little bit insofar as the renewal is, um, we, we've been engaging a lot in exercises of what should we keep, what should we modify and what should we just relieve ourselves of, of things that have happened during the pandemic. Because it, the pandemic, if anything, showed us one, where our weaknesses and vulnerabilities are within, within and as a community, um, but it also showed us where our strengths are. And so we were able to identify where some of those strengths reside to be able to maintain some practices that we engaged in over the, over the pandemic that were very successful. And so we wanna renew ourselves. We wanna come out the other side of this. We wanna pick up on those really important pieces of work that we were doing prior to the pandemic um, and, and there are many things that are happening that will allow us to do that, whether it's work in curriculum, work in the IB. This year we have our, our big IB reauthorization meeting with International IBO. Um, we've got a lot of work going on that's going to start in earnest in the next month or so around our new strategic plan that's going to be coming together, that's going to have a lot of community input. Um, so we've got a real great opportunity for um, some wonderful renewal. So sustainability, um, again, kind of became our theme this year. Um, and part of that is uh, the ra rationale for the sustainability piece, as I've talked about here before, is we have a really beautiful new high school um, that, is, uh, it, that is really green. It's uh, going to be a net zero ready building. It's going to be lead gold. It's going to have, it has vegetative roofs to help deal with some of the stormwater management. It's going to have PV arrays that'll take a significant portion of the electrical off the grid and be able to provide that through uh, through solar energy, we have uh, geothermal wells for heating and cooling, so we don't have HVAC units running all the time for electric. Um, and that really gave us an opportunity, and this is something that was lost, I think, in the pandemic, to really teach about what is sustainable, what is sustainable, what food sources, economic sources, energy sources, et cetera. And so at the, at the pre-pandemic, PP maybe, I, I don't know if we'll call it PP, pre-pandemic, we probably shouldn't call it that. Anyway, uh, pre-pandemic, we were talking a lot about, um, Kristen, I don't know what that is. Um, we were talking a lot about the sustainability goals. And there's a core group of teachers that you'll see at the end of the presentation tonight that presented a convocation to really talk about this next slide, which is the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And when you look at these 17 goals for sustainability, um, Kristen, if you go to the next slide, um, these goals around sustainability, one of the things you'll see is that this is incorporated in sort of everything that we do uh, from day to day. And it's part of the International Baccalaureate Program um, about how to be responsible, how to be internationally minded and the like. So um, this core group of teachers have really picked up with these sustainability goals from the United Nations. They've started the, the sustainability work at the high school to the extent that they've actually begun a, a course sequence for a sustainability academy at the high school that we'll build over time. This year, we're offering the first course of a sequence called Energy and Power um, that talks about the foundations of sustainability. And they're using the building as a teaching tool. So when they talk about energy and, and power, they're really speaking about, um, about hydro, uh, hydroelectrics. They're talking about um, photovoltaics. They're talking about all kinds of different things that we have in our high school, and we're really excited about that. So um, for a little levity, I, I wanted to show you a video that we shared at Con Convocation. This is our um, uh, Rob Carey, our one and own Rob Carey. Uh, Rob is the associate principal at Mary Ellen Henderson Middle School. He's also in the running right now as the middle school associate principal of the year. Um, we'll see how he does. Um, but Rob, Rob, as you may or may not know, has an extraordinary sense of humor, but this is the video that kicked us off at Convocation this year.
Well, we'll give it a try. Actually, this is a sustainability video, so that's fine. We'll let it go. Sustainability is so much more than just environmental science. It's also about social justice, and economics, and design. One example that comes to mind for me is housing equity and affordable housing. These are very important things with regards to developing sustainable cities and communities. What's exciting is that these examples fit perfectly into an existing framework that connects us to a broader global community. And that framework is the UN's Sustainable Development Goals. With the new Meridian High School coming online last year, that afforded so many new opportunities for us to be able to expand upon the many sustainable related projects that are already taking place within the schools district wide. We realize that every one of us in our division is involved with sustainability each and every day, whether we know it or not. We asked some of our colleagues to share with us how sustainability is woven into the work that they do. So I'd like to talk to you about sustainability in the art class. Uh, these are some examples of coil built pottery done by students here at Meridian. And it's based on a lesson where we have studied a man named Juan Cazado Salado, who's a Mexican potter who lives in a small rural town uh, known as Mata Ortiz in the Chihuahua section of Mexico. He actually discovered ancient pottery from the Mimbres and Casa Grandes uh, tribes in his local area. And through his study, he found the techniques that they use, coil-built pottery, and also the design elements that they used and revived this um, style of pottery and began to make it himself. Um, he didn't find a market in Mexico per se in his local area, but he did find a market in the U.S. and then it became known worldwide to the point that now there's over 300 families in Mexico that earn all or part of their living through the production of Mata Ortiz pottery which is known worldwide. The sustainability initiative as articulated for Falls Church City Public Schools is something that ties in really well to what we're doing at Meridian in the English department, particularly in the 11th and 12th grade English courses. IB asks students to trace a global issue through the text that they study throughout their junior year. For example, last year, one student looked at how the novel, The Joy Luck Club, in short stories by Russian author Anton Chekhov, illustrated that oppressive gender stereotypes often discourage female authenticity. Here at Jesse Thackeray Preschool, we welcome students ages two through four. Our team works with students and their families to make sure that their first experience in our school division is awesome. Our team is committed to closing gaps so all of our students enter kindergarten ready for success. In history class, sustainability shows up in all of the events, politics, economics, and environmental issues that we study. Uh, especially when it comes to social injustices and inequities. I asked my kids to look at things from different perspectives and to see how these events have shaped the world that we live in today and how would they rewrite history to make the world a better place. For instance, I asked them to debate and draft new constitutions for post-Civil War that offer the best chance of long-lasting peace. Another one is in the Great Plains and westward expansion. How would you do equitable land usage between Native Americans, farmers, coal miners, railroads, and even cowboys. It helps them to understand that their generation is going to be the ones to fix things. And these UN you know, sustainability goals are really the first step. While teaching in second grade, I became a National Geographic certified educator so that I could connect my students with Nat Geo scientists from all over the world and with different teachers all over the world through the scientists. One is ePals, where we connected with uh, second grade students in India. We learned about plants and animals within their country and with our country, and the students got to communicate their wonder and their excitement and their learner agency, their skill sets. Having that wonder and excitement and reflection really builds that belief that I can make a change. This is exciting. Action is exciting. We are all lifelong learners and it is a goal of mine and I know FCCPS to provide the foundation that all students believe 
they are lifelong learners too. So there are various ways that I see sustainability show up in our building, specifically in my classroom with fourth graders. I have my students really look at water and the process of cleaning and purifying water. And we go through a water purification or water filter challenge where students have to design and engineer a water filter and we test it to clean dirty water. This is great for students because they're not only becoming thinkers, but they're really exploring and understanding how they can connect with their community and um, clean their planet. When we celebrate the Hispanic Heritage Month in Spanish, students have the opportunity to research Hispanic heritage people who have made great contributions to the American society. In the beginning, students always think of female singers and male uh, baseball players. But once they start uh, doing their research, they quickly realize that they're famous and important people in business, scientists, judges, politicians, and they are all from both genders, and they all have made great contributions to the American society. With this project, students can think of a future without gender roles and stereotypes. The Family Research Center serves more than 50 families. We help them by building their lives in Falls Church, helping with registration, making sure they have school supplies and winter coats. We offer parent workshops, adult English classes, and other community resources. When new families arrive, we reach out to them right away and include them in the community. So in transportation, sustainability involves reducing the number of vehicles on the road in order to reduce the amount of greenhouse emissions that's all over the U.S. The latest push is electric vehicle usage. FCCPS is excited to announce that we have submitted an application for the grant and funding of two electric school buses. Hopefully this time next year, we'll have two electric school buses that we'll put into operational use to transport some of our students. Thanks so much for sharing your practice. Now that we've seen these examples, we invite you to consider the ways that sustainability shows up in the work that you do every day. So that was um, a really great opportunity for us to sort of leverage around some ideas that came from the high school. And I'm happy to announce, as Michelle Johnson said, she had put the application in for the two electric buses. We actually got the electric bus uh, grants, and we're very excited to be um, on the list to begin building infrastructure for those buses as early as uh, January. So a um, couple of notes about the video just uh, for coverage purposes. Um, there were uh, a number of folks in there, that the B, it's B-roll, so it's from years past. So you saw some kids that weren't masked. That's because that was old video footage and old, old photographs in case anybody was worried. So let me go on and um, welcome the new teachers. I'll show you this, the slide. I think this is at the end. If we could do that at the end, okay. Yeah, so let, let me talk about um, our welcoming week. And I wanna thank um, William Bates, Chief Academic Officer and his team for really pulling together, I think an extraordinary um, onboarding process for our, our new teachers this year. Obviously um, it was different than it's been in the past, um, but we utilized our new space at the high school and in the Innovation Commons, we were able to host um, about 40 uh, new teachers that we welcomed to the City of Falls Church. Um, and here you'll see a couple of slides. Um, but what was what was unique about this year was that um, one of our, our administrative interns, um, Jamie Osborne over at Henderson, um, was the person that was responsible for really pulling together the week. So it was a teacher um, who was working on her administrative endorsement and wanted to take on an extra project to get some hours. And so she put together this week along with our curriculum and instruction folks. And these folks got a really great Great welcome to um, our school. So you see some folks here from each of the schools. Um, one of the things you'll note in these pictures is that you'll recognize some of the faces because they were new last year. But last year, um, when they were new, we didn't have an onboarding forum because we went right into um, online instruction. So we didn't have the week back with teachers. So this year, we were fortunate enough to be able to bring some of those folks that missed it um, in and welcome them in. A couple of things of note that I thought I'd share um, about the first weeks of school and even prior to um, this year, we had another 
successful number of events uh, regarding pop-up registration. We had three of them, one at Berman Park, um, one was at Oak Street Elementary School, and the other was at Falls Green. Um, I was fortunate enough, along with my colleagues at the table, to be at Berman Park and at, um, at Falls Green, and some of, some of the folks here also went to Oak Street, um, where we welcomed a significant number of families. Um, over 30 families were there, um, and we had students register from all of our schools that came to the pop-up registration. And the idea behind these pop-up registrations is to really bring registration to our families. Um, and this is the third year in a row that we've done this with something new we started several years ago. And uh, Erica Siquera um, in the Family Resource Center has been really used, uh, really helpful with a lot of this as well, getting the word out. A couple more pictures this is from day one. Um, I, I had a chance, it was so funny. Um, I was over at JTP and they delivered the lunches and as I, and as I was in the classroom and they delivered the lunches and I said, you guys all set, you got everything you need. And they said, we didn't get our milk. And I was like, I'll go get your milk for you. Anyway, it was fun. I got to deliver milk that day. I felt like the milkman um, walking around JTP. So um, good times there at Jesse Thackeray. You'll see some pictures here at Mount Daniel. Uh, Mr. Kasich there uh, in the background. We've got our, our buses rolling. Um, then at Oak Street, you see the team uh, there in the upper uh, upper left. And, and Ms. Downs, uh, thank you so much for joining me. And uh, Dr. Ruiz Milanos uh, and Dr. Anderson also were able to join for a couple of the schools as well. Um, and that was really a lot of fun. Next is Henderson. And you'll see our, our middle school kids already are starting to use the new uh, field out um, by the park, the new parking lot to the southwest uh, of the school. And then they're also eating outside. You'll note in the upper left-hand corner, we have sort of an outdoor patio area that's specifically designated for our middle school students. They come down from the cafeteria um, through the high school cafeteria down the stairs and out the back. Um, and we have made some decisions just by the way, um, sort of pandemic decisions, but are good long-term decisions. And that is that we're gonna create some um, more permanent spaces back there to eat. Um, so we're going to add some benches and we're going to add some picnic tables and we think that Kenny George uh, and his class are going to be able to make those picnic benches for us for the back. And then the last is the high school and this was um, the first official full year opening of our of our new high school Meridian. Um, and I, I will say um, for as um, difficult as it may have been for some of our parents to get through uh, the kiss and ride the first couple of days at Henderson at, at Meridian. Um, we're proud to say that the bus loop and Mustang Alley was open from Haycock all the way out to Leesburg Pike on day one. Um, that was something that we felt like was sort of touch and go. Um, but we had a lot of adults that were out there, including many of us that are at the table. Um, the first several days of school, helping um, move traffic through, making sure kids were safe and the like. And so since I'm on this slide, I thought I'd just take a second before I talk a little bit about enrollment to give you a quick update on where we are with construction. Um, and let you know that we are down um, in the building, we're, we're essentially done. Um, we're down to just a couple of punch list items that we've continued to work out. So um, continue to be um, right on target with the building. Um, the external facilities are coming along. Um, there were uh, the biggest concern that we have right now is getting the trapezoid parking lot completed. Um, of course, that has uh, cr created a little bit of lag in our schedule. Um, and it's because there was a complication with Falls Church Gateway Partners with the city of Falls Church, um, ourselves and Gil Bain and the coordination around that trapezoid parking lot. But the good news is that by the end of this week, it looks like we'll have at least stone or, or maybe next um, and potentially even a base layer of um, asphalt for our open house, which is gonna be October 2nd um, at the high school. And I'll talk more about that later. Um, the plantings are starting to go in the grass. Most of the grass will go in on Thursday on the east side of the building. So the east side of the building is going to look quite finished with the exception of the uh, area east of Mustang Alley. So they're working again through the trapezoid and now they're working on the, the grove area um, where the memorial bricks will be laid, the trees will be put in and the like. Um, all of that work should be done for our October 2nd open house. Um, that is a, a pretty significant deadline for us um, to make sure that they meet um, with the exterior plantings. The issue for us with the plantings is that the um, company will not that, that provides the landscaping won't warranty them, the plants, unless they're planted at a particular time of year. And the particular time of year is mid early to mid-October. 
Um, so that's just taking a little bit longer to get into the ground, but um, those will be done um, probably by uh, the earliest, it will be the first week of October, but no later probably than the late October. But those will be the last things that will go in along with the external furnishings. On the back side of the building, there are a couple things that are being cleaned up, if you will. Um, one is there was a grade issue uh, with the softball field. So they had to tear up a portion of the softball field and regrade it to make it right. Um, and then they still have the fencing to do around um, the softball field. And then they will be putting on the um, pavement and asphalt on the tennis courts and finish up the, uh, the fencing over there within the next week or so. So we, we're really down to a matter of weeks, not months. Um, we're still under budget, actually on, I'll say on budget. And then when I come in with a little bit of money, I'll, then I'll say under budget. But right now we are on budget. Um, the building of course completed on schedule. Um, and the exterior facilities because of the trapezoid are a little bit delayed, but um, everything else is, is on time. So feeling really good about where we are uh, in this moment. The other thing that was good that happened yesterday is that students that walk along Route 7 now have a walking path from Route 7 through Henderson, Pat, um, on the, be on the north side of Must, um, Husky Loop. So the students don't actually have to walk into the, um, into the, paved area, the driveway, which is where we had some cones off and had some adults there. So it took kids out of the flow and, and we're feeling like that's a much safer route and that's the more permanent route. So feeling really good about the safety um, of kids coming up. On the um, Haycock side of Mustang Alley, all of that curb and gutter and all of that concrete along the path that goes um, sort of adjacent to the Virginia Tech site has been completed and that's in its final, um, final stage at this point. So um, feeling really good about it. So any questions about, um, the, about the high school and the timeline or anything like that before I move on? Otherwise, I'll keep on going. All right, so um, let me talk a little bit about opening school report. Um, and I, I just wanna um, caution the board and those that are at home that these are preliminary data points um, around our opening um, data and we have some information we've done some analysis of it and I want to be able to share that with you. Um, so if you look at the um, year over year what you'll see is down the left hand side our schools and across you'll see enrollment by school by year. So for example, if you look at the Meridian High School school year 1819 was 844 went to 849 went to 867 last year and then we projected to be at 901 this year. So where we're finding ourselves um, sort of across the board is that we um, compared to last year are up at Jesse Thackeray, up at Mount Daniel, down at Oak Street, down at Mary Ellen Henderson and down at Meridian. Um, and, and we are down, um, uh, I would say not a significant number of students, but down enough to make us wonder what's going on. So we've done a little bit of analysis in that. The place where we're really finding ourselves down is from our projection. Remember last year, we had an option to choose three different options. One was the nobody's coming back. The next was the middle road and the next was the high, high end. And we selected the middle. Right now we're 94 students away from our projection. The reason I wanna caution the board that these are preliminary numbers is that we're getting kids every day with what's happening across the world, particularly in Afghanistan. We're seeing some students come into our schools. So we're seeing enrollments bump up. Um, but I, I wanted to just show you a couple of things or talk about a couple of things um, that may be of interest and, and may give you some context for where we are. Um, the first is the homeschool um, situation. Uh, as you may remember, we did have a number of students that left for homeschool last year. So two years ago, pre-pandemic, we had 31 families, I'm sorry, 33 families that were homeschooled. Last year, that number jumped up to 72. So we had 72 families homeschooled last year. This year, we're, we're back to 31 families homeschooling. So we actually have less families homeschooling this year than we did two years ago. And, and more than half have come back from homeschool from the prior year. Um, so I think that's an important data point for consideration. The second data point, and this one is, is maybe more um, concerning to me, just in terms of equity, um, and making sure that we have a very diverse community is looking at our ESOL population of students. Um, two years ago in 2019-20, 2020, 
we were at 161 ESOL students. Last year, we dropped to 148. And this year, we're at 115. And that's a, that's a precipitous drop for us in ESOL. And when we talk with folks, um, there are a lot of sort of theories out there about why that happened. Um, and one of the theories, and I think it holds, is that many of our ESOL families, um, for, for, for better or for worse, um, work hourly jobs. And many of the hourly jobs in this area sort of dried up during the pandemic. And so we know that a lot of people moved because of um, the job situation. So we are um, trying to dig in and learn a little bit more about that. Um, it certainly, I, I don't think was for lack of support from the schools. Um, you know, we provided um, lunch and, and breakfast to all of our students. We provided meal boxes for families that were on free and reduced lunch. Um, we had a number of families that sort of were both ESOL and free and reduced lunch and were able to provide support that way. But um, that is disconcerting. So when you add those two categories of people together, um, the homeschool is coming back, but uh, down ESOL. The other piece that, that we're missing some students into is Jesse Thackeray. Um, normally, we'll, we'll account for about 72 students at Jesse Thackeray. This year, we've only enrolled 58. So that accounts for more than half of the, decl uh, not decline, but half of the gap between what is projected. So if we had met what we normally would meet with Jesse Thackeray and our ESOL students were to come back, that 94, which is the, the delta in the um, projected enrollment, would be closer to about 45. Um, so those are some of the data points that we've been looking at. Um, again, this is preliminary information. In November, you'll get the full enrollment presentation with all of the data that comes from Weldon Cooper as we begin the budget process. And the chart that you'll get in the next presentation in November is gonna look a little bit like this, which is the enrollment by grade. Um, and, and we won't go through this tonight, but um, bottom line is when you look at the variance from last year and look at the lower right hand corner, we are down five students from last year overall and 94 from projection. So I have no doubt that by the end of the fall, we'll be back up to uh, at least where we were last year, um, but we just haven't been, we haven't been finding our, our preschool kids. Um, and we aren't finding our ESOL, our ESOL populations. And that is not an unusual circumstance, just by the way, as I talk to my regional colleagues, um, many of the colleagues in the region are seeing their ESOL numbers drop pretty, pretty dramatically um, over last year. So um, we're gonna end this presentation with, uh, now with the final, um, final video. And I, um, this is our own Rob Carey, um, putting his spin on coming back to school. So uh, with that, um, I'll turn it over to Rob. And they were like, you're bald. And I was like, <laughs> like it's, right? That was unfortunate. What are you most excited for for this school year? I'm honestly really excited for the first day because I know it's a weird thing to be excited about, but like I want to see like my teachers and like have that awkward like, oh, hey. I'm most excited about probably meeting new friends and like having fun again. I'm excited about getting back to some normalcy. Uh, it's been kind of a crazy year. Totally agree. I'm most excited about meeting new friends and recess. What is your favorite thing about school? Recess. Uh, I like recess and lunch. Activities. Activities. What about recess? Yeah. That's what everyone's saying. Um, my favorite thing about school is that we do crafts and that I get to see my friends from preschool. Emerson, what is your favorite thing about school? Um, sight words. How long would it take you to name the 50 states? Should I name all of them? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Florida, Georgia. South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, um, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York, uh, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, uh, Vermont, Maine. What is a prime number? Ooh, pass. Pass? That wasn't an option. Oh my gosh. Okay, five? Okay, I guess you're right. A prime number is any number that is only divisible by one in itself. That was impressive and I'm tired. Who is your favorite teacher of all time? It's actually you. Hey! I did not know that was coming. I did know that was coming. Who is your favorite teacher? Uh, Mrs. Heater. Who is your favorite teacher? Miss Lakeisha. Uh, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Kentucky, Tennessee, um, Alabama, Mississippi, uh, Louisiana, 
Oklahoma, uh, Kansas, Nebraska, South Dakota, North Dakota, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Missouri. If you were to participate in one Olympic sport, what would it be? Swimming? Why? I like water. Archery. Why? Because I'm good at it and I like it. No way. Oh, that's cool. Fencing. Fencing? Really? Why? Because I like it. What is one thing that teachers love? Uh, good students. Good students. Is that you? Maybe. What is your favorite meal? McDonald's. If you were to go to McDonald's, what is your order? Um, I would ask to walk out. Ooh, you don't like McDonald's? Like a sausage egg McMuffin meal with a hash brown and a black coffee? What did the plate say to the fork? Don't worry, dinner's on me. You can laugh now. If you were to go to Starbucks, what is your order? A venti chai tea latte with no water and no foam. Is that a run-on sentence? Uh, I guess? Yeah. That was really impressive. I actually thought that was gonna be a lot harder for you. Um, and now I'm kinda stumped, I got nothing. All right, Emerson, I'm dizzy. And it's 48 million degrees out here. Who is your favorite middle school associate principal? I don't have one. There's literally <laughs> one. You had a vote, and I'm still working on that part. Who would be the middle school associate principal of the year? You just run half a lap. It was a long half a lap. We love our Rob Carey. So anyway, that's how we kicked off the year. Um, we're really excited to be underway. Um, we're, we're excited uh, to see our kids. We're excited to see our families. Um, uh, you know, just so, some quick statistics on vaccinations. Um, we're down to, um, oh, we have over 500 vaccination cards for our employees in the Google form now. Um, and we have five employees that aren't vaccinated. So, uh, and we're working with those five to um, provide a testing protocol for those five, uh, in addition to some um, additional mitigation strategies to ensure that they're safe. Uh, we're seeing a, a large number of our kids starting to put their vaccination cards into our Google form as well. Um, something I think went out today to the high schools, but maybe not, it will be if it hasn't, from Ms. Hardy saying that there are multiple ways to get the form in, uh, to get the card in. You can email it, you can, I think there's, you can take pictures and the like. Um, but I think the last number I saw was about 465 students had put their vaccination cards in, um, which is really good news uh, as we think about the, the winter sports coming up and identifying the universe of kids that aren't going to be, uh, that aren't vaccinated. Um, and so once we know that number, we'll be able to make some good decisions about um, winter sports. Um, but again, I, I just want to remind everybody to get your vaccinations um, and to maintain strong mitigation factors, wear your mask, use the multiple layers. Um, and through the multiple layers of mitigation, I think we're going to do really well. So, uh, and so far, so good. We had our first um, sort of impactful case uh, where a couple of students had to go home um, yesterday for quarantine. Um, but uh, that was the first. That was the first of the cases where it was more than uh, more than one kid. So, um, so so far, so good. And uh, really excited about the year to come. So, with that, um, that ends this tonight's spotlight. Usually, our spotlights are about five minutes long. Um, but we thought since this was the start of the school year, it was a good spot to put the update for schools. So um, welcome any questions that you may have. Um, and if not, we can we can continue forward in the agenda. It's up to you. All right, if the board has any um, missed downs, go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Nina, for that great presentation. Uh, stepping back to the uh, high school, uh, are we going to run, I know a couple community members have asked, uh, Neighbors have asked me who no longer have kids in the school system um, if it's going to be open to the oh. community at large. I'm assuming the open house will be. Yes, I, I'm so glad you brought that up because I had mentioned it earlier and I forgot about it. You can put this date and time on your calendar, everybody. October 2nd, which is on homecoming weekend from 9 o'clock in the morning to 11 o'clock. I'm sorry, 9 o'clock in the morning till noon. Um, we have had that sort of date identified for a while. Um, and now it has come to uh, come to pass that we're going to do a, a ribbon cutting, um, a very brief one, though, because we did the whole ribbon cutting virtual piece uh, from 9 to 915. 
And then starting at 915, people can come in and tour the high school. We're gonna ask that people come in, they can walk as family groups if they want, uh, wear a mask, they can walk independently, and we'll have student ambassadors posted throughout the school that will be able to talk about the variety of aspects of the school, um, including all of those sustainability aspects that we mentioned. So we have some sustainability ambassadors and then we also have other ambassadors. And the sustainability ambassadors, just by the way, um, have been trained in all of the elements that are associated with sustainability. And that was part of the lead credits that we got. Um, so because we put a curriculum together, essentially that um, promotes uh, the aspects of the school and trained our kids, um, we got a point on the lead scorecard for that. So uh, we're excited to do that, but there'll be a flyer coming out uh, later this week to put the save the date for October 2nd, nine to noon, um, should be a lot of fun and uh, hope to see all of you there. Great, and, and will we be able to run an ad in the news press for community members? Yes, we yeah. talked about that yesterday okay. and we actually are gonna use multiple modes of communication around this, including right. the news press. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, just a couple other questions, Ms. Litton, if it's okay. Um, so, you, Dr. Noonan, you mentioned that um, surrounding, I, I guess, well, you mentioned that surrounding school systems also saw a drop in the ESOL population. Um, what about, have you had a chance to touch base with um, your colleagues in the surrounding um, divisions and just enrollment in general? Are they seeing a bounce back? Are they seeing, um, are they sort of where they were last year at COVID? Have you, has it? I'm just, I'm just curious. Yeah. What, no, what? it's a great question. And we haven't really okay. talked about it. Okay. Um, Ms. Michael, do you, have you heard from any surrounding jurisdictions at this point? Cause you through operations and budget may have heard. And I had talked with some jurisdictions when we were still in August and they too were seeing lagging enrollment. Um, but we're just now working on the wavy guide with the surrounding jurisdictions. Okay. So we should get a much better read from people later this month okay. as we get closer to the official September 30th. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, and a couple other questions. Well, one, I guess, is a comment um, for those who are were looking at the presentation and maybe new to the system. I, I believe the discrepancy between Mount Daniel and Oak Street from 2018 to 2019, 2019, 2020 is because second grade went back to Mount Daniel. I think that's why those numbers, right? So we just like in the future, we might want to just put an asterisk because that looks odd. Sure. <laughs> you know? Yes. If you don't know why those numbers yeah, no, that's, that's so, right. That's so right. dramatically. Um, and but, the, that's an excellent point. Yeah. On the following chart, we color coded them by school, but, but that's an excellent yeah, point. So, so yeah, thank just, you. In case anyone was new and didn't realize why those numbers seem so off between those two years. Yep. Um, and then I guess, and this is probably more for Ms. Michael, um, do you anticipate any budget implications, you know, based on the not hitting that production? So we um, continued to watch enrollment over the summer and really looked at where did we need the set number of teachers we had at grade level, right, as compared to where did our enrollment um, indicate where potentially we could not fill a teacher position. Um, so when we look at it, and we had this similar thing happen last year. So if you remember last year, mm -hmm. the way our students broke across grade level, we actually didn't fill two teachers and a paraprofessional, right? But when we looked at enrollment broken out by grade this year, we just had one position um, that we were able to not fill and still maintain all of our class sizes. Okay. Um, so as we look forward, my assumption is that for next year, we'll again have some type of an enrollment increase. And since we're so close, um, that we we'll potentially need that teacher that we didn't fill this year back. Okay. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, and then I guess just uh, one or two other questions. Um, Dr. Noon, do you feel that, I know it's a lot on your staff, you know, all across the board with COVID and, and the um, mitigation strategies, do you feel everyone's, are there any sort of resources or anything that you feel that this, we need, we need some support here or there, any particular school? That might be, I know it's a lot, yeah. you know, for your teachers and staff, I can't even imagine. I think, I think the best thing that can happen right now is to let us get back to our roots. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, in many ways, um, we have tried to limit any new initiatives. We've tried to limit any new processes or protocols, unless they actually were supporting efficiency and effectiveness, um, because we just didn't want to add one more thing to the plates of teachers. Um, and we really want to get our teachers and staff back into the classrooms working with kids. So I think as we move forward, um, I think the central office folks, including myself, are kind of hoping for that uh, as well. Obviously, with the um, strategic plan, it's going to take some time for us to, to really pour into that. But that's really important as we emerge from, from COVID. Um, so I think, I think the gift of um, 
of allowing the year to kind of ride a little bit would be maybe what I think all of us would appreciate the most, if that makes any sense. That, that does make sense. Uh, and then my final question, uh, I, re, or I think the school board received an email um, from a parent of an elementary student talking about, you know, as vaccines, you know, if it, I guess the latest is it could be by yep. Halloween that they're approved for the youngers. Um, and wanting to know, um, you know, what would be the metrics where we can take off the mask, you know, and, and, and obviously I know we follow CDC guidelines and Virginia Department of Health and Fairfax County Health. Um, so that's, I'm assuming that's just something that's way too early to tell. We would have to, we don't really have any, I guess this, this parent was looking for, are there certain metrics if we hit this, this range of vaccinations and that sort of thing, but I think it's probably too early to. I, I think it's too early. And, and to be perfectly honest, I think the, vet, the metric is going to be when the CDC says it's safe to take our masks off. Right. Right. Um, and, and let me, let me just say this, um, we had a really good call this morning. Well, we had a, we had a call this morning. I don't know if it was really good, but we, we had a call with VDH uh, and VDOE this morning, um, to talk about, um, vaccinations for students under 12, because we had that conversation and because they've asked us to start gearing up and getting prepared for it gives us a very strong indication that the vaccine is going to get some sort of. Um, authorization as early as October 31st, but probably the 1st of November. Um, they are, the, they being the VDH and the VDOE, are asking us to work very closely with our health departments to do school-wide vaccination clinics, as opposed to having students go to their pediatricians, to CVS pharmacies and the like. That's different guidance than we had before. Um, what we were told before was when the younger vaccinations are done, it will be easy for pediatricians to be able to administer that, et cetera. The issue is that the timing of when that authorization is gonna come is gonna be right at the same time as people will be getting their booster shots and their flu vaccinations. So pediatricians and doctor's offices are gonna be crushed with boosters and flu vaccinations. So they've asked us to um, work with our local health districts to try to figure out how to do that. So we immediately got on the phone again with our health right. district because we wanted to do that before. And they said, no, we're gonna let the, the other groups do it and said, can we set up a meeting and talk about this? So we actually have a meeting scheduled for Monday at three uh, with our health department to try to begin the planning process for um, mass inoculation of our students under 12 that are in the city of Falls Church schools in, in hopes that we can do those either centrally or um, at the school sites. So um, stay tuned for more, but we're working closely with them um, and trying to be a bit of a squeaky wheel, right. but also a test site, a, right. a, a pilot site too, for how it can work, because that's one thing that we really, I think, helped with in the original round with staff testing was we were essentially the proof of concept that this can be done. And they took the model that they used with us at Meridian and then distributed vaccines at all of the other schools the same way they did it here. So we're trying to be that, that first um, group like we were previously. Great, thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you, Ms. Downs. Mr. Redinger, go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Noonan, for that mm -hmm. report. I uh, wanted to explore a little bit more the decline in the ESOL population. The way you describe it, it's not at all surprising that you know, in, in more expensive areas like Falls Church, there'd be a decline because of the decline in employment that a lot of ESOL families have had to make. But have we, um, I, and, I, and I know we took steps, as, as you described, to make, uh, you know, to reduce food insecurity through the pandemic. But have we done any exploration yet with some of the uh, more affordable housing locations in the city to see if you know, that we've had families go? Um, I, I think it might be interesting to talk to the city as well to see if they've seen a changeover. And the last thing I'd suggest specifically is to ask the question to the ESOL Advisory Committee um, because you know, with people in the community, um, I think that they might give the administration some good data on the reasons for the reduction and if there are steps that could be taken to reduce the dislocation that some of the ESOL families must feel if they're you know, moving out of the city and going other places. So. Yeah, thanks for those questions. Um, certainly, we can talk with the ESOL Advisory Committee, and we've spoken with 
um, at least one member of the Family Resource Center board as well. Um, but with respect to your question regarding affordable housing and uh, are we in touch with the city, for example, and any anyone associated with some of those affordable housing dwelling units, the answer to that is yes. Um, we have been working really closely with um, the folks at the city around affordable housing to the extent that actually we got some information just last week that one of our um, larger affordable housing units um, had raised the rent. Um, and unfortunately, that was starting to displace some families. So we immediately went to the city housing folks and said, is there something that can be done to cap the rent on these places or subsidize the rent or whatever so that we can keep these families in place? And I believe that there has been at least a conversation um, with that dwelling uh, unit um, to, to help support that. So we're trying to keep our finger on the pulse of that because we do want to keep affordable housing affordable um, because that's oftentimes right, wrong, or different where we get some of the diversity in our school systems and it's su super important to us to maintain that level of diversity. Great, thanks. Uh, Dr. Anderson. Thank you, uh, Sherilyn. So I'm, I've got a several questions I could ask, but I'll build on Mr. Reininger's question. Dr. Noonan, and I wonder, given that there's a lot of information out there about um, families in which some of the students are having to stay home to take care of other siblings, um, if we're not seeing the students, not necessarily because the families have had to leave, although I'm sure that's happening based on what you've told us and what we're seeing, are, are we just missing students who are basically having to stay home and take care of their, of their siblings? That's one. And then another thing associated with it is we know that Sort of trust in vaccination, fear of COVID is is variable across different demographic groups, and so I'm wondering how much of of the missing students may also be in in places where there's just some extra fear of of going out there that might lead to that. So what are we doing about about those? Well, the first to your first question, if they're students of ours, we we have tracked them down. Um, we've gone and done home visits. We've met with families, and so to my understanding, we we don't have a kid that's at home caring for another kid that isn't coming to school. Um, we've been able to track, um, track those students down. Um, with respect to the, to the other question in terms of um, fear of, of vaccines or um, engaging, um, I, I think that that's a, a legitimate question that we need to sort of continue to wrestle with. Um, and I know that there was a, there was a period of time where um, certain communities throughout the Northern Virginia region were not getting vaccinated for one, either fear of vaccination, um, but more so um, taking up a, um, some sort of service that might require them to give information and the fear of potentially deportation or something else by engaging in what they perceived perhaps as a governmental operation. Um, and so hopefully we're breaking down some of those barriers with our social workers um, and with, with um, Erica Siquiera, who's working in the community. Um, but I would say on balance, our, our families are known to Erica through the FRC, particularly those that speak Spanish, um, but that doesn't capture all of our ESOL kids either. So I wanna be really clear about that. Our second largest language population is Russian. Um, so, um, so we've got to, we, we're trying to reach as many students as we can. Okay, thanks, I um, appreciate that. The other question on the projections, I had a couple of, a couple of questions. Um, the enrollment projections are set to a specific date. Is it um, the official date, September 30th? Is that when we're sort of comparing apples to apples? Yeah. Okay, so some of that discrepancy, presumably not. That's why I was it, really clear, it's preliminary. It, right, yeah. Some of it will be um, resolved a little bit by that date, but it's, it's still a ways in the future. Uh, it's not that much far, I'm sorry, it's, it's coming up close. The other question I had is on the decrease for the enrollment of JCP. Mm -hmm. Um, we know that women have been disproportionately affected by the mm -hmm. pandemic, and I'm wondering if some of this reflects families that would otherwise have enrolled their students for whom parents may be at home. Do we know anything about the about the demographics of that? I mean, it's hard to know because you don't have a student there and you don't know a family that you could go to. But I, I don't know. Um, you know, one of the things that we can ask, you know, those are some good questions that we can ask and we can dig into. I don't know the answer to that question, but it could be that there are more stay at home mothers that had to leave the workforce and haven't returned and now they can care for their preschool age child. 
Um, but I don't know that for sure, but we could certainly do some digging around and see what we can find out. Okay, yeah, thanks, I'd appreciate it. Um, and just to your last point, I, and I'm sorry, I looked away for a second. Um, <laughs> Dr. Santiago is watching at home, and she wanted to make sure that everybody knew at the pop-up registrations, which she was responsible for putting together with a, a group of folks, along with Rebecca Sharp, um, the, the pop-up registrations led to a number of people getting vaccinated as well. And we did offer um, an opportunity for folks to go get vaccinated from there. Excellent. Um, may I continue with a couple yeah. of other questions? Yeah. I just want to make sure I'm not taking the stage from my left. Um, so we've talked, now you, you nicely segued into my next set of questions, which were about vaccinations. Um, in addition to the parent email that we had about um, what's the plan when vaccinations become possible for the, the younger students, um, we've also had a few uh, re districts in the region that have been put in place requirements for vaccination to participate in after school, school sponsored activities. What is the thinking for, for where things look right now for, for SBCPS on that? So we're, we're, um, I wouldn't say we're taking a wait and see attitude. I think we're gathering information and collecting data before we make a decision. Um, so right now what we're doing is we're collecting vaccination cards from kids. Um, I'm trying to understand what the universe of students are that aren't vaccinated because I suspect it's relatively small considering um, all of the vaccines that we offered and the students that were vaccinated outside of the school. Um, and then, and then working with each of those students that aren't vaccinated to find out one, are you planning on attending or planning on participating in after school activities and athletics? Um, but at this point, we haven't um, formally announced a, a decision. Our vaccination rate for our kids 12 and over is all, uh, above 90%. So I'm not sure that we need to do that. And I want to make sure that before we say we're going to do it, that we actually need to do it, if that makes sense. So, yeah. so, so Valerie Hardy is helping collect some of those data for us. Yeah, I understand this sort of for getting that information background. I guess I'm trying to figure sort of, and I understand the idea that rather than trying to impose a mandate, if you don't need to impose a mandate, um, soft encouragement instead is, is sort of preferable. But um, if at some point it becomes a potential vector uh, of infection yes. from unvaccinated students to each other or to to staff, I think I'd be concerned that we aren't, you know, looking at all of the tools that we might have available to us. So Understood. do you have any sense of sort of the timeline on that information? I, I would say um, we'll likely make a decision about that one way or the other within the next week, maybe okay. two. Um, and, and the other thing that's going to happen, um, we believe anyway, based on the epidemiology that's been shared with us from the Virginia Department of Health and the University of Virginia who's tracking this is that there's gonna be a fairly precipitous drop in the curve um, within the next two to three weeks. And the reason for that is the high vaccine rate and the high infection rate that to, it, we're gonna to get to a point where the community is saturated to the extent that there isn't gonna be a place for the virus to go anymore. You're either gonna be vaccinated or you've had it. So we're expecting that that drop is gonna be pretty precipitous and, and bring our numbers down even further. That being said, I, I understand your point. I, I, it's not that I don't want to mandate it. I, I will if we need to. If it's a if it's a mitigation strategy that we have to put in place, we will. Um, but I, I want to just know if if 100% of our kids are vaccinated that are playing sports. I don't want to put in a mandate that doesn't necessarily have to be there. So we should know more probably by the end of, uh, end of next week. Okay. All right. Thanks. Um, I have a couple more, but I'll, I can stop. Why don't I see if anybody yes, please. else? Um... I would like to uh, make clear that a couple of these I'm going to rely on behalf of Dr. Dimmick, who, who isn't able to be here, but uh, wanted to make sure that we that she had a chance to ask the question. If it wasn't already part of the presentation, of course, it already was, so we're good. Great. Um, and that question basically is sort of other mitigation strategies. One of them is lunches outdoors. We saw that the mm -hmm. middle school students are doing that. Have we, what are we doing in terms of thinking about making that a more systematic effort, especially for the younger students, like at the elementary schools, they have to meet outside on the blacktop. I know that they were having the back to school, you know, back to school, meet the, meet the PTAs and meet all the other folks tonight out on the blacktop. So there's plenty of space. The question, I guess, is are we doing anything about making that more systematic for the students? It, it is the system. Uh, I, I mean, the truth of it is, is at our schools, the expectation is that kids eat outside unless they, they don't want to. And, and most of our kids at the elementary schools are eating outside. 
So I was asked the question um, by Dr. Dimmick, what percentage of our kids are eating outside? I don't know what the answer to that question is. Um, I, I'm not even sure how I would collect those data, to be honest with you, but I, I do know that it's a very high percentage of our kids that are eating outside, both at Oak Street and at Mount Daniel, which are the two most important for me for kids to eat outside because of the, the lack of vaccinations mm. at that age. Um, so if you go by either of those schools during lunch, the kids are sort of all over. We just hired another recess aide at Oak Street to support the outside um, activities during lunch and at recess as well. So we, we have a very high percentage of kids that are eating outside. I can just <coughs> jump in here. Our fourth grader, it's just routine. They just all walk outside for lunch. It's not even a question, you know, it's just yeah. how it is. And so, yeah, definitely at, at Oak Street, I can definitely say that. And, and it's, it's at, um, at Mount Daniel as well. We've got tents that are outside and kids just walk out and they eat. We had a, a very unfortunate circumstance last week on, uh, where some kids went outside and six kids got stung by bees. Um, fortunately, none of, them, um, none of them had anaphylaxis, which was good because that would have been really bad. But then uh, we moved them to the other side and it was fine. So um, in terms of making it uh, maybe more endemic and, and making it a long-term plan, um, I, I, I think at least at one of the two schools, the staff is really happy to have the, staff, the kids eat outside. Um, the other, we, we haven't really gotten a good feel for yet. Um, but I, I suspect as long as the weather's good, we're going to continue eating outside. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Dr. Yeah, I appreciate it. And then the only other thing I was going to say is um, just a thank you for the work that um, Michelle did on getting the school bus route taken care of. We had some questions and there was definitely a lot of interest in the community and I've had feedback that folks are really, really pleased with the changes and grateful for the work. Well, thank you for saying thank that. You. This was Michelet's first year um, as our transportation director with families on the first day of school. Um, and it, she has uh, been through the ringer as, as you, you might say, um, and she's really, she's handled it really well, um, but, but it has some scars, you know, from it. Um, and uh, some people were particularly unkind, unfortunately, but she's, she's gotten through it and, and uh, I, I'll, we'll be sure to pass on that appreciation because I know it'll mean a lot to her. And we're, we're very excited to have her here. If you're watching at home, Michelle, it's gonna be okay. <laughs> we appreciate you. Thank you, Trevor. Okay. Uh, Dr. Ruiz Bolanos, did you have a question? <laughs> yeah, sorry. I was just gonna follow up with what uh, Dr. Anderson was saying. Thank you, Geraldine. Um, Dr. Noonan, so I had a couple families reach out to me today, letting me know if kids are the ones deciding at Mount Daniel, whether or not they should be eating outside. And they were asking because they were hoping that it was more across the board and not really their child's choice. Um, do you know how that's being implemented? Uh, I, I don't know off the top of my head, um, but I certainly can get that information. Thank you. Sure. I know kids are eating outside and they're kind of all over the place. So I, I definitely know that kids are eating outside. I just, I, I don't know the why there was a, yeah, yep. something was, yeah. Thank you. You bet. All right. Anything else from anyone? All right. Not seeing any other questions. I guess I would just like to say thank you to you mm -hmm. and the staff. I know the community is really happy to be back in school um, in a in a relatively normal manner. So that's that's my sense of what I'm hearing and feeling from people is it really feels relatively normal except for masks. And I think the community's really excited to be there. So thank you to for everybody's work, teachers, uh, central office, all of the staff. We really appreciate that. Well, thank you. It means a lot to us. Yeah. Thanks for your support as a board. All right, I think we covered a lot in that item, so thanks. <laughs> All right, next we will move on to public comments and requests. Um, and before we do that, I need to read this statement. Well, the City of Falls Church Emergency Ordinance 2011 remains in effect due to COVID-19. Written statements may be submitted to the clerk for dissemination to school board members. Please send written statements to school board clerk Mar Marty Goodell at goodellm at fccps.org. Public comments received by 10 a.m. on the day of the meeting will be posted on board docs prior to the meeting. Individuals wishing to appear virtually and make public comment 
during the meeting via Zoom must register in advance by emailing school board clerk Marty Goodell at goodellm at fccps.org with their name, address, contact information, and topic no later than 5 p.m. on the business day before the meeting. Individuals who wish indicate they wish to speak will receive an email with their speaker number and information to access the meeting. Individuals will speak in order of their speaker number. The board will receive comments for up to 30 minutes or until all registered speakers have been heard, whichever comes first. In accordance with school board policy, BDDH, each speaker will be limited to three minutes. Um, Ms. Goodell, do we have uh, any yes, speakers did, or comments? We did receive one written comment to the board and it was regarding the vaccinations for students. Great, thank you, Ms. Goodell. All right, next we will move on to our closed meeting. Um, is there a motion to move to closed meeting? Uh, Dr. Anderson? Chair Lytton, pursuant to the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, I move that the board convene a closed meeting for the following purpose, to discuss or consider the identified subject matter. Personnel under section 2.2-3711A1, in particular, staff appointments, staff reassignments, staff resignations, staff retirements, staff performance, staff change in position, staff termination, dependent care leave, long-term medical leave, child care leave requests and leave of absence, and superintendent's contract and advisory committee appointments and resignations, and student matters under section 2.2-3711A2, in particular, non-resident tuition students, and anticipated residents under policy 9.21, section three, and legal matters under section 2.2-3711A7, in particular consultation with legal counsel and briefings by staff members or consultants pertaining to actual or probable litigation, where such consultation or briefing in open meeting would adversely affect the negotiating or litigating posture of the public body. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Is there a second? Thank you, Mr. Henderson. Uh, Ms. Goodell, can you call the roll? Yes, Dr. Anderson. Yes. Dr. Dimmick, oh, she's not here. Ms. Downs? Yes. Mr. Henderson? Yes. Ms. Litton? Yes. Mr. Wright, right yes. here? And Dr. Ruiz Bolanas? Yes. Thank you. Great, thank you, Ms. Goodell. Um, um, I think what we're gonna do is actually, if the staff wouldn't mind stepping out, just because we have so many of us here tonight, I'm not sure that there's a conference room everybody would feel comfortable in. Um, so if you all wouldn't mind heading out, that'd be great. And Kristen, if you could um, put up the thumbnail and mute us, and then we'll hop on. Um... She, she is getting uh, Ms. Dimmick. Oh, she was okay. letting Ms. Dimmick. Okay. What we'll do is we'll, we'll just stay here and we can um, use the link on your individual computers. So if you could um, take us offline, Ms. Michael, and put the thumbnail up and mute. We're gonna go ahead and stay in here.
We're good, right? Okay. All right. Welcome back. Um, can I get a motion to reconvene to open? Uh, Vice Chair Downs. Chair Litton, I move that the board reconvene to open meeting. Thank you. Um, can we have a second? Uh, Mr. Henderson? Thank you. All right, let's get up. Uh, Dr. Anderson? Yes. Dr. Dimmick? Yes. Ms. Downs? Yes. Mr. Henderson? Yes. Ms. Litton? Yes. Mr. Reitinger? Yes. And Dr. Ruiz Bolanos? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Goodell. And can I get a certification of the closed meeting? Dr. Anderson. Chair Litton, whereas the Falls Church City School Board has convened a closed meeting on this date, pursuant to an affirmative recorded vote and in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act. And whereas section 2.2-3711B of the Code of Virginia requires a certification by this school board that such closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Falls Church City School Board hereby certifies that to the best of each member's knowledge, one, only public business matters, lawfully exempted from open meeting requirement by Virginia law were discussed in the closed meeting to which this certification applies. And two, only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Reininger. Um, Ms. Goodell. Yes, Dr. Anderson? Yes. Dr. Dimmick? Yes. Ms. Downs? Yes. Mr. Henderson? Yes. Ms. Litton? Yes. Mr. Reitinger? Yes. And Dr. Ruiz Bolanos? Yes. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ms. Goodell. All right. Next, we have Section 6, Recognition and Reports, and 6.01 is VSBA Welcome Back to School. Yeah, and this is the time of year that VSBA does their annual campaign of pictures of school board members with signs welcoming back our students to school. Um, so tonight, everybody gets to get a picture taken um, together as a group holding up one of our signs that says your school board members welcome you back to school. And if we do it just right, we can get Dr. Ruiz Bolaños in the back and uh, get everybody in the picture. So I would invite the board tonight to come on up. Uh, John's going to take your picture and you can hold up your signs and there's three of them up here. So and then we'll send them on to the VSBA for you. Yeah, I need to separate the right the back. I'm crazy. <laughs> All right, thanks for that. Next, we move on to the consent agenda. Um, do we have any questions or concerns before I call for a motion to adopt the consent agenda? All right, seeing none, can we get a motion on the consent agenda? Mr. Reitinger. 
I move that the board approve the consent agenda as presented. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Let's see. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Dimmick. Uh, Ms. Goodell. Yes. Dr. Anderson? Yes. Dr. Dimmick? Yes. Ms. Downs? Yes. Mr. Henderson? Yes. Ms. Litton? Yes. Mr. Reitinger? Yes. And Dr. Ruiz Bolanos? Yes. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ms. Goodell. All right. Next, we will move on to our business action and information. Um, item 8.01 is the Falls Church City School Board Bullying Prevention Month proclamation. So October is Bullying Prevention Month. Um, so we have a proclamation for board members to sign and I'm going to go ahead and ask Ms. Downs to read the proclamation. Chair Litton, whereas school bullying has become an increasingly significant problem in the United States and Virginia, and whereas over 20% of the youth in the United States are estimated to be involved in bullying each year, either as a bully or as a victim, and whereas an estimated 160,000 students in kindergarten through 12th grade miss school every day due to a fear of being bullied, and whereas bullying can take many forms, including verbal, physical, and most recently in cyberspace, and can happen in many places on and off school grounds. And whereas it is important for Falls Church parents, students, teachers, and school administrators to be aware of bullying and to encourage discussion of the problem as a school community. And whereas the Falls Church City School Board has developed a policy on anti-bullying to encourage positive behaviors and to eliminate bullying behaviors. Now, therefore, the Falls Church City School Board recognizes the month of October 2021 as Bullying Prevention Month with the intention that the issue of bullying and its prevention be discussed in Falls Church City Public Schools during that time. Great. Thank you, Vice Chair Downs. Um, can we get a motion to adopt the Bullying Prevention Proclamation? Uh, Dr. Ruiz Bolanos, go ahead. Thank you, Chair Linton. I move that the school board approve and adopt Proclamation 1-21 Falls Church City School Board Bullying Prevention Month, October 2021. Great, thank you. Is there a second? Uh, Mr. Henderson? Uh, go ahead, Ms. Giddo. Yes, Dr. Anderson? Yes. Dr. Dimmick? Yes. Ms. Downs? Yes. Mr. Henderson? Yes. Ms. Litton? Yes. Mr. Reitinger? Yes. And Dr. Ruiz Bolanos? Yes. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ms. Cadell. And Ms. Downs, do you mind passing it down to have folks sign it? Great. Thank you, everyone, for that. All right. Next, we have item 8.02, approval of the superintendent's contract. Um, the board is very happy to have come to an agreement with Dr. Noonan on the contract for 2021 through 2025. So I want to say thanks to the entire board for everybody's work on this. We, we really appreciate um, all the work everybody put in to, to getting this done. And thanks to Ms. Minson for her help. We really appreciate it. So with that, can I get a motion on the superintendent's contract? Uh, Mr. Henderson. Start over. Yeah. Okay. I move that the board, with the concurrence of the superintendent, terminate effective July 1, 2021, its existing contract with the superintendent ending June 30, 2023, and simultaneously authorize the chair to execute on behalf of the board an agreed upon contract for the reappointment of Dr. Peter Noonan as superintendent of the Falls Church City Public Schools for a term beginning July 1, 2021 and ending June 30, 2025. Great, thank you, Mr. Henderson. Do we have a second? Second. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anderson. Ms. Goodell, can you call the roll? Yes, 
Dr. Anderson? Yes. Dr. Dimmick? Yes. Ms. Downs? Yes. Mr. Henderson? Yes. Ms. Litton? Yes. Mr. Reitinger? Yes. And Dr. Ruiz Balanas? Yes. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ms. Cadell. And congratulations, Dr. Noonan. I know we all really appreciate your leadership and your commitment to education. So we are excited to have a contract in place for the next four years. So congrats. Well, thank you, Chair Litton, Vice Chair Downs, and the rest of the board for your incredible support. Um, obviously, um, when I made the decision to come here four years ago, um, I had no idea that I would be here for eight and maybe more years. Um, this has really been a place that um, has been special to me um, and to the extent that we've actually moved our family here, um, as everybody knows, this summer, um, bought a place here in the city of Falls Church. And, and part of the reason for that is we, one, we wanted to be here where I was working, but more than anything is we want, wanted our own child to be in the schools here um, and to graduate from Meridian High School. So I do appreciate all the support that you've shown me um, especially in the last 18 or 20 months. Um, it certainly has been a challenge and knowing that um, I'll have an opportunity to be here for four more years is, is really exciting to um, myself and my family. So looking forward to carrying on with uh, the good work that we had to set aside 18 months ago as we move forward in the system. So thank you. Great, thank you, Dr. Noonan. We're looking forward to it. All right. Next sure, week, sure. oh yeah. One quick comment. Um, I would just like to thank you on behalf of the board for all the work that you have put into this and you as well, Vice Chair Downs, and again, Ms. Minson for your work, but thank you for leading us through this process. Certainly. All right, next we will move, our next two items are policy related, 8.03 second reading and adoption of policy JFCL. And I will go ahead and turn it over to Ms. Minson. Thank you and good evening. We have one policy for second reading this evening and it is policy JFCL, notification regarding prosecution of juveniles as adults. This is something that we do every year, but we did not have a policy on the books for it. So it makes sense to add the policy and get in alignment with the VSBA model policies. There was one proposed change moving um, the phrase two students up to line four from line five but otherwise this is the same as the policy as presented for first reading. Are there any questions about policy JFCL? All right, seeing no questions, can I get a motion on second reading and adoption of policy JFCL? Uh, Dr. Dimmick, go ahead. Chair, I move that the school board approve second reading and adoption of policy JFCL, notification regarding prosecution of juveniles as adults. Thank you, Dr. Dimmick. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Reininger. Uh, Ms. Goodell, can yes. you call the roll? Dr. Anderson? Yes. Dr. Dimmick? Yes. Ms. Downs? Yes. Mr. Henderson? No. Ms. Litton? Yes. Mr. Reitinger? Yes. And Dr. Ruiz Bolanas? Yes. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ms. Goodell. And next we have first reading of policies and back to Ms. Minson. Thank you. We have four policies for first reading this evening. The first is policy KGD, use of school facilities by the Falls Church Recreation and Parks Division and other city government agencies. This would replace current policy 5.35. It's not a model policy from the BSBA, but instead is the practice that the board has had in place um, for many years of using, um, of encouraging community use of school facilities. And since the board updated policy KG, community use of school facilities back in July of this year, we thought it made sense to bring this um, concurrent policy explaining the use of school facilities along as well. Um, as I often do, I present in red any changes to the policy. So here in strike through is what had been in the previous policy 5.35. And in red is what we would propose changing. And many thanks to Kristen Michael for her help in going through this. We wanted um, this policy to be consistent with our current practice. So you'll notice a few changes such as the entity that's using the facility is responsible for supervision, which is what we have done in the past. And we also added a reference to an MOU, a memorandum of understanding with the city um, that is reviewed annually and then signed by the superintendent and the city manager every five years. And we anticipate we're gonna have that signed um, actually in the coming weeks, um, but that has been our practice to make sure that we have good, clear communication on how facilities are used and cleaned and what the fees are. So um, do think that it makes sense to move forward for this policy.
policy and happy to answer any questions about policy if you do. All right, seeing none, moving on to the next policy to um, first reading is policy JO student records. We have a current policy 9.8 with the same name. Um, the VSBA model policy is very similar to our current policy. In most regards, it's word for word the same, which is what is required under the Virginia Code. Um, but there are a few substantive changes. The new policy JO clarifies that electronic information related to a student that's not part of the student's educational file, such as an email that references a student, then doesn't fit, need to be provided to a parent in a FERPA request, um, unless that email is printed out and put it in, in the student's actual physical file. Um, that will make responding to requests for records much easier for school staff and clear um, for us as to what we will be providing to parents upon request. Um, this also clarifies that any information regarding a student's criminal disposition that happens um, while they are a student and is shared with the schools is then disposed of when they graduate. That's not currently taught under policy 9.8 and is best practices and is what we should be doing. Um, there's also the explicit statement that anyone um, who needs to have knowledge of protective orders um, and orders prohibiting contact with the child, that's something we've done but wasn't part of the student record previous um, or the student policy record policy previously. Also clarifies that agency caseworkers, such as the local child welfare agency, can have access to student records. And finally, we have not updated our list of directory information in six years, so there are a few updates in green font proposed. I do want to point out that since sending this to the school board on last Thursday to review, we've also proposed adding line 16 that elementary students' teachers' assignments are included as directory information. We've been working with the PTAs and PTSAs to, on um, directory information of what they can provide in their student directory and wanted to be clear um, whether or not we can say who a student's homeroom teacher is or the elementary school level classroom teacher is. So by adding that as directory information, parents will know that if they consent to directory information being provided, sorry, move the mic closer. Um, if parents consent to directory information being provided, the student's um, homeroom teacher or the elementary student's classroom teacher assignment can be provided, but there still is a way that parents can exempt their students from all directory information being shared. Um, and that's included on InfoSnap every single year when parents register their students. So JO in many ways is substantively similar to 9.8, um, the current policy, but there, I did wanna call out those, those few differences. Any questions about this policy JO? Oh, Ms. Ruiz Bolanos, go ahead. Thank you, Ms. Hinton. Um, so just to kind of, I think you know the history of PTAs, right? The elementary PTAs. Um, when we try to get parent room, room parent information and get class lists, is this policy inhibiting or helping in any way for that process? I feel like there's a lot of time spent doing that. And is there a way to facilitate it? Yes, we hope that this is helping. I've spent a couple hours on that today and feel badly don't want to stand in the way of sharing information, but also want to make sure that we're protecting information that parents don't want to share. So by adding elementary students teacher assignment as directory information, anyone who does not exempt themselves or their students from directory information would be consenting to sharing that information. So hopefully this will make it easier going forward. And I did have a chance to um, email the current elementary school PTA president about that today. So um, we think this is a good solution to include it explicitly in the list of directory information. Thank you. I know hundreds of parents will be thanking you for many years. Ms. M uh, Carolyn, may I? Yeah, go ahead, so, Vice Chair Dan. So, Ms. Vinson, so you're saying that on InfoSnap, when there's a sort of three categories, don't share my information with anyone, share it with the PTA. I think there's a third, I can't remember. But anyway, the one that says you can release it to the PTA. So that's what you're saying is that then that's the directory information. Am I get understanding? Yes, it it's okay. can we release your directory information to the PTA? And, so you're and now by including class it, list yes. under the directory, so the teacher would, name, yes, the teacher name. Okay, that's, that's right. right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So and, and, there could be a class list of all the students in one teacher's class. And, and part of it is a, a nuance in language because oftentimes people think of a directory as like the directory that you that's get, right. and, that's and, right. and that's not when we call a directory, that's the directory right. is all of this information right. or much of this information. So I think this will resolve a lot of the issue going forward. Okay, great, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Dr. Anderson, go ahead. Thank you, Chair Lynn. Uh, on the same chunk, so it's what, lines five, 499 to 521. 
So I want to make sure I'm understanding it clearly. Directory information, there is a specific definition in the policy up above, and it, it basically is talking about information whose release wouldn't breach some personal identifiable information as part of the educational record, that sort of general thing. Correct, yes. So part of that, I guess I'm trying to understand the, um, the purpose for that, right? It would seem like you're trying to guard information whose release could actually harm the student or the family in some way. A lot of this information looks to me like things people would be would really like to have access to if they were trying to do identity theft or something like that. So I want to make sure we're educating folks about the fact that they can say no to specific parts and, and all of that. And ask some questions about um, then some specific items in here. So if I can do that. So the first part is just sort of making sure that we're making it clear that people can get out of can say no to this. Yes. And what that implies if they actually say yes to it. Yes. So directory information um, families every single year can choose to opt in or opt out. So the specific directory information will be shared unless a family opts out. And then there is a way that parents can get in touch with um, teachers or registrars at the buildings to go through if there's certain things they don't want shared. Okay. Okay. And that, that process for the specific thing is something that they get through in PostNap being told you can call this number or, or email this person. How do they get that? They either opt in or opt out, but we are, we do allow parents to then follow up and say, well, I don't want my student's birthday shared. For example, that I'm okay having their image used in morning announcements or their, their, my email address being shared with families for purposes of planning outside of school events. Okay. And I think there's language to that effect in InfoSnap. You know, if you have a question about directory information, call your child's school. Yeah, that's what I just wanted to reconfirm. I don't remember. I know well, I crafted can, yeah, an we'll email with Ms. Connolly today that we're going to be sending to families that also will provide that information as contact. Yeah, that, that's right. Because I think I, I don't remember, there could be in there. I don't remember that language. But Dr. Noon, I think you're right that I think when people see directory, they think the phone book, you know, like, right. And so I don't think they understand it encompasses all of this. So I don't know if it's like that or even maybe it's a it's a hyperlink to the policy. I don't know what it is, but maybe somehow that they if they want more information, what exactly directory information means that they can figure, you know, they have easy access to that information. Thank you. And and thank you as well, because you were you were taking exactly where I was going. It's <laughs> helpful. Thank you. Um, I guess my other question then is on some of the items in here, number nine and ten and eleven. Uh, is this post graduation from our schools? It start, I don't understand how that ties in. I thought adding major field of study would make sense if we were going to have a specialty program or a governor's school or something at our school, if this would allow us to share that. Um, but we certainly could remove that if we don't think that that's necessary, if that seems more post secondary in nature. Enrollment status is, is whether a student is currently enrolled okay. or not. Um, and uh, most recent educational institution attended. I, I could see that maybe at the kindergarten level of where the, did the student go to preschool if that's something that wanted to be shared. But I also think that, um, that it's, it's, actually, be removed. it's actually really important though, because sometimes records, um, records when a student transfers from one school to another, if records aren't requested at the, at the proper time, it's really hard to find out where the kid went to school. Um, and so if that's in there, that, that then is helpful for tracking down student records from past places that they've gone. So if a student, for example, went to Marshall High School last year, came here, but we didn't get the record, we can then go back in, determine where they could go to school last year okay. more easily. Thanks, that's really helpful actually. I was just, because I was thinking that one way it could be used, I was also wondering whether this is something that might be helpful for um, longitudinal tracking of our students um, with alumni groups and, and sort of setting up those sorts of email lists and that kind of thing. So that's where I was sort of wondering what the intent was behind that. Okay, thank you, Ms. Minton, for your work on this as always. Sure. Any other questions on policy, J.O.? All right, moving right along. So the final two policies this evening um, would be coming from our current policy 8.38 retirement and turning that into two separate policies. Um, right now, our policy 8.38 is quite outdated, last reviewed in 2012, and it references two different VRS, Virginia Retirement System plans, one of which is no longer in existence, so really would like to move to policy GBO, the VSBA model policy, 
that simply states that all eligible employees must be members of the Virginia retirement system and that the Virginia retirement system has rules and regulations that govern the employee retirement benefits. So that's the, the, the very straightforward policy GBO. The policy GBOA, again, thank you to Ms. Michael for working through this. This is a Falls Church specific policy. So this is, this is not part of the VSBA model policies. And this takes what is on the very back of policy 8.38 that recognizes that Falls Church City has a retirement plan and that school division employees who are not covered by VRS, but who work um, 20 hours or more per week and are on a PAR will be members of the Falls Church City retirement plan and that the Falls Church City Re Retirement Board has its own benefits, eligibility and procedures that then govern um, that membership. So we thought it made sense to keep that as a policy and make it clear for staff that that's where um, the guidance is and replace policy 8.38 with GBO and GBOA. Any questions about policy GBO or GBOA? I'm sorry, what is PAR? Kristen? PAR is personnel action report. So it's the difference between a contracted employee, um, you know, who's permanent versus somebody who does hourly temporary work. So for example, we could have a substitute that's exceeding working 20 hours a week um, but they would not be eligible for retirement because that position is seen as temporary versus on a contract. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Michael. Any other questions about GBO or GBOA? All right, that's it for policies this evening then. Thank you. Great, thank you, Ms. Minson. All right, can... I get a motion on first reading of policies. Uh, Vice Chair Downs. Chair Litton, I move that the school board approve first reading of policies GBO, Virginia Retirement System, GBOA, Falls Church City Retirement Plan, KGD, use of school facilities by the Falls Church Recreation and Parks Division and other city government agencies and JO student records as presented. Thank you, Vice Chair Downs. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Dr. Ruiz Bolanos. Uh, Ms. Goodell. Yes. Dr. Anderson? Yes. Dr. Dimmick? Yes. Ms. Downs? Yes. Mr. Henderson? Yes. Ms. Litton? Yes. Mr. Reitinger? Yes. And Dr. Ruiz Bolanos? Yes. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ms. Goodell, and thank you, Ms. Minson, for that. All right, next we will move on to section nine, future agenda topics. Um, does anybody have any future agenda items they'd like to raise? Uh, Dr. Dimmick. Thank you, Chair Litton. Um, I was wondering if at the next work session, we could look, we could see what the Fairfax, a calendar similar to what Fairfax adopted this past year would look like for us and what the implications for that would be. Um, I'm also curious about um, coming up in November, we have some, we have school holidays, we have religious holidays, and I'm wondering if we have a number of teachers who decide to make a long weekend of it, do we have a sufficient number of uh, sub substitute teachers? Thank you, Dr. Dimmick and yeah, go ahead. Actually, I, I'm, I'm curious to know if there's um, support from the board for that. I, I'm just looking at the two week window and wonder if we if we have the moments to do a calendar that would reflect um, what we'd have to do some research on what Fairfaxes did exactly and then put something together. So I'm, I'm trying to think about the two week period. I know we were gonna have a work session about the calendar. So maybe we could share the Fairfax calendar perhaps in, instead of coming up with a calendar. If that, um, yes, I guess I, I, and I'm, I, I would be, I, I would love to know what the rest of the board thinks. I, I think we should give serious consideration to this calendar and I will be greatly disappointed if we are brought calendar options when it's time to vote on the calendar and this isn't under consideration. So we don't make the calendar. <laughs> I, I just want to make sure everybody knows the calendar is made by the calendar committee. And, and we certainly can share the board's um, desires to have multiple options. And, and of course, we would share that information with the calendar committee. But if the calendar committee says we don't want to do that, I, you know, I, would it, how would you like me to handle that? 
it's my understanding that um, we make recommendations to the calendar committee. Um, this is a very large recommendation because it would be a different conception of how uh, religious holidays are recognized. It would also be a change to our spring break. Um, but I believe if there's a willingness on the board to consider it, then this would be a recommendation of the board to that calendar committee. So can, oh, go ahead, Dr. Anders. Thank you, Chair Lytton. So I'm in alignment with Dr. Dimmick in the idea that exploring the calendar that Fairfax has come up with as an option for Falls Church, I think it's something that I would also like to see. Having a, having a work session in a couple of weeks that discusses what that calendar is. You know, this is what Fairfax did. This is what some things that the committee would have to consider in deciding whether or not this is something to go forward with. Just to lay the groundwork for that. Is that kind of the spirit of what you had in mind, Dr. Jimmy? I think that's something I would be that, interested in. That we in. can do. I, I just don't know that we can put a whole model calendar together for what it would look like in the City of Falls Church. And I also am concerned that that might send the message that that's the desired outcome before we actually kick it over to the committee. So how about if we do that as part of the planning process for the work session is to share what Fairfax did, just to give you a sense of what the model looks like. Is that? I think that and sort of some of the things that we'd have to think about mm -hmm. just as yeah, a start, right? Mm -hmm. But then yes, there's the, the further work session that is already planned. And then I think what you're saying, if I'm hearing you right, Dr. Dimmick, is you'd like to see at the end of the process, assuming that the calendar committee hasn't just looked at it and said, no, this is just absolutely not feasible, at least one option that kind of goes along those lines. I think I'd be interested to see a range of options and unless the committee just absolutely rejects it as is this totally not feasible for us, I'd want to know why not mm -hmm. and see see how this would work out, what the implications would be. Um, so I'm, I'm in support, I think, of the idea of exploring that as, as something. So I think it makes sense. Oh, go ahead. So I, I also, you know, I, I put it in a slightly different frame of reference. I, I agree with Dr. Demick and with Dr. Anderson that you know, I would like us to have a discussion about the guidance we're giving the calendar committee before the calendar committee starts to work. We've had problems in the past where the calendar committee thought there was a discussion to be discussed. And the board is actually the entity that decides on the calendar. And so I think a work session, whether that's a two weeks, I, I, I'm not particularly wedded to that notion. I just think we ought to do it before the calendar committee gets started because we do think it's most, most efficient. And like Dr. Demick, I'm, I'm particularly interested in exploring the sort of model that Fairfax is doing to see if it is um, better fit. And I'll talk a little bit about some feedback. There was a, a daycare advisory board committee meeting last night and perhaps I'll just presage and, and not do my liaison comments later, but there's a continuing concern represented by some members of the committee about the challenges that the religious holidays that we put into the calendar this year um, present for working parents who now since those are school holidays, they have to pay extra for those days. And as you might imagine, since the daycare um, employees, the after care employees, you know, often do other things during the day, they're not available for those days. So staff days, reduction days, there's a real challenge with a lack of slots for the people who are doing it. So I think those are some of the things that we would want to explore in a work session. I by no means, Dr. Newman would suggest that you know, the that the, the administration do any sort of mapping out of what's feasible or what's not. To me, at least, it really ought to be a discussion about what are the guidelines of the calendar. In terms of religious holidays, but if there are any other guidance that we would want to present for purposes of putting some parameters around it. Thank you. And, and I appreciate the conversation. And, and Dr. Dimmick, I'm not pushing back on the idea of exploring it. I What I was struggling with was putting a calendar together with a model. So maybe I misunderstood what you were asking for and, yeah. and if so i apologize i i just wanted to make sure that the calendar committee didn't get launched without yeah. really us thinking about what it what we would like to see so so i would invite you to go back to the presentation that we did because all of the board because we did ask some pretty pointed questions in that presentation and ask for some feedback 
Um, and, and if you haven't given us the feedback yet, please feel free to do that, but also know that we'll come back at the next, I think we're planning to do the next work session on the calendar and we can gather more information. And of course, everything that you share, we would pass on to the calendar committee. The calendar committee is not gonna start in the next two weeks. So um, there's no plan to launch that committee until we get information from you. So if I wasn't clear about the timeline also, that's why we came to you early we wanted to get feedback from you before we actually launched the calendar committee so um, please know that um, of course we would take your recommendations to the or thoughts to the committee i just i get stuck if the committee decides you know what this is really not workable then i think they would need to explain why certainly um, but but i i would like to leave that um, leave that to the committee and then kind of following the process we've done we've sent out that um, multiple options to the staff and given them an opportunity to rank order those and I would share that information with you. Of course, you can always reject all of them, one of them, whatever you want to do, because at the end of the day, it is your decision about what our calendar is. Um, but we do want to get that engagement with the staff as well. And, and Dr. Noonan, just to clarify, I think it was my understanding based on our conversation that our next work session was going to be further discussion from what we did in August because so many of us weren't weren't there or lost that, power. It was kind of a correct. chaotic night. So I, I mean, Dr. Dimick, I would think the the Fairfax County that should be part of our discussion at the work session. Sure. Is, is that your understanding? Does that? Yes, I I'm, okay. That's pretty. I got it. Okay. Okay. So is everybody? feel okay about that being the next step. Uh, Dr. Anderson. Maybe it's because it's prematurely late in my brain, but I'm just making sure to clarify. So in some sense, our discussion in two weeks is going to be a, an extension or continuation of the conversation we started back in August with a chance for us to have reflected on it and then others who weren't able to be there or lost power or the other chaos that did happen that night, we're taking care of it. That's my understanding, and I think uh, yes. we're I'm hearing that's that. what the board wants. That, so. That's the plan. That's what I. That's been the plan. That's what I hear what you want. Um, and we certainly will bring the county's the Fairfax County calendar for you to look at as an as an. Um, and I and I would say not as an option, but as um, an opportunity to see the whys for what they did. Perhaps. All right. Thank you for that, Dr. Dimick. Um, are there any? other future agenda items that people would like to raise. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Henderson. Yeah, I would like for us to address um, the policy and the renaming of our schools where we could not um, entertain um, the names of anyone that was at least 10 years past deceased. Uh, it seems to me that that's an antiquated, irrelevant rule um, that neither Fairfax County or the United States Navy um, entertain. And also think that it handcuffed the committees that were trying to come up with the name during that process. So I would like to see that policy rescinded. All right. Um, thank you, Mr. Henderson. I know you have raised this before. Um, I have consulted a, a number of the board members. We've talked about it, so maybe we can touch base after the meeting a bit more on this. Um, I don't know that there was enough support to potentially move that forward, but, but we can talk a bit more individually uh, um, with you and among the board about that issue. So that means that no one is interested in having a discussion about that or are there is this something that is not important enough to talk about in the discussion with the board members um the the sense i got from board members was that they were not supportive of making a change at this time now, if it's something you you want to bring forward, um, the the board 
could, you know, if you bring it forward as a motion, then as a board, we need to, to consider that. Um, but I just wanted to give you a heads up on what the conversation had been. You know, I, I really feel that um, when we voted on the renaming of the school, it was my very first board meeting. And um, if I had a more experience with the board at the time, I think that I would have uh, been more deliberate in my comments and in my uh, actions during that meeting. Um, but I do feel that it's antiquated, unnecessary, and no one else follows it. So why are we adamant about keeping it? We can talk offline about this if you wish, but uh, I'd just like to express my displeasure and the fact that no one is in agreement about this antiquated, unnecessary uh, handcuffing of the namings. And we may not have to deal with it for years to come because we just went through that. But I disagree with the rule. And I think it is, uh, not something in line with what anybody else is doing. So I don't know why we're doing it. Thinker. So I'm happy to respond to Mr. Henderson on substance. I, I, I don't disagree at all with you on whether the rule is antiquated or not. I mean, I think there's a good reason for it in the sense that sometimes things come to light, but it is certainly a rule that sort of it, 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 it has differential impact because people who've made an immediate effect recently are less likely to be considered to have a school name change. And that's a worthy discussion to have. Um, so I, I agree with you on that point. My personal opinion is it's not a discussion we need to have right now. Um, and the reason I don't think we need to have it right now is we've just renamed two schools and there's no real prospect of building a new facility for anywhere for years in the future. So um, just because you know, we've, we've now started a new school year, and you know, this goes back to what Dr. Noonan said about you know, trying to keep things as steady as possible, um, this feels to me like a, a discussion that we could have in a few months or, right, or um, next year or whatever. There's just no immediate need. And I think the, the more important things to focus on for the board right now um, are things of immediate effect. For example, the reopening of schools or what's the calendar gonna look like next year? Um, so in, in, in the long term, uh, Mr. Henderson, I would agree with you about having that discussion. Um, I just don't think it's, I, I wouldn't put it as a priority matter for the board to include at this specific moment. So that's, that's the reason for where I am. I can understand that, you know, but, um, you know, I may not be here when that discussion is had, and I feel strongly about it. So maybe um, before I drop off the board, we can talk about it. Great, thank you, Mr. Henderson. Um, any other comments on this item? Uh, go ahead, Ms. Oh, Downs. I'm sorry, not on this oh, item, no, but okay. if, is it okay if I Yes, ask? go um, ahead. Dr. Noonan, I think we were going to have a presentation on uh, test score data, and, and is that when is, is that it's scheduled for October? October. Okay. Sorry, it's that scheduled for October. Okay. All right. So, so the work session this month would be calendar, and then. Yeah, I, I think that was the bulk of it, and okay. then next month. Yeah, the bulk of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, and I, was, I, you know, I think sometimes it's, it's, um, you know, the public that asks us questions and trying to say, you know, we are getting to it. It's on our agenda. So, so I know that some people had asked about test scores, so that's coming up. Yeah, I think it's um, actually, I think it's inappropriate to do too much presentation on test scores right now because there, there's no context, um, there's no information 
Um, the only way you can look at these data right now is in a very simplistic way that doesn't give any information about how it impacts classrooms, how it impacts the experience of kids. So we want to make sure that we have put the appropriate amount of context around it. Um, and we're actually writing something up that will help you if you do get questions about data um, that I'm hoping to get to tomorrow. Dr. Dr. Wheelanman is helping me with something. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Ms. Stans. Um, anything else? Anyone? Go ahead, Dr. Anderson. So it's, if I may go back to just to address Mr. Henderson's point um, earlier, just speaking for myself, Mr. Henderson, on this one, I'm in alignment with Mr. Reidinger's point that the, the urgency for tackling that aspect of a naming um, policy is, it doesn't seem like that is as urgent a matter for the board as some of the other things that we have to do. For me, the other reason that um, I would want to, that would take some more time and I think um, other things right now are more important than that in timing, is that if we're gonna evaluate any aspect of the policy, I would want us to evaluate the whole thing. It doesn't make sense just to take one section of the policy out of the context of the rest of it. And to me, that means that we'd have to, there would have to be some, some real time and thought uh, devoted to that at a time when we do have other things we're getting ready for next year's budget. We have the calendar to consider. We have reopening schools to consider. No doubt COVID is going to throw us some kind of a some kind of a, a curveball that we're going to have to deal with. It's just that timing for me. I, I don't want to give you the impression I don't think it's a worthy subject for discussion. It's just it's it would take longer than I think we have to devote to something there. And the time urgency of there isn't likely to be another building anytime soon, I think it's there for me. But I'm only speaking for myself. So Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Is there anything else from anyone? All right, not seeing anything else on this item. We will move on to number 10, superintendent's report. And Thank I'll you. turn it over to Dr. I think the bulk of the report was in the uh, spotlight this, mor this morning. <laughs> it's all running together um, earlier this evening with the opening of schools. But a couple of things I do want to mention. Um, just want to thank everybody for their support um, this last weekend for the run for the schools um, and also thank the Ed Foundation. It was the 17th annual um, run for the schools and they had a record setting number of runners out there. There were 850 people um, and it has it was a very impressive morning and want to thank a couple of other folks that helped with that. Um, the Meridian High School cross country and volleyball teams who brought great energy along the route um, who were volunteers out there. Um, and also helping with the kids in the play area so their parents could do, um, do the run. Five students were our, I guess I shouldn't tell this, but there were five students that were involved in the mascots um, and guiding them through the process. Um, and numerous FCCPS staff um, ran and, and volunteered. So thanks to our staff for doing that. Also wanna give a shout out to the police department, the sheriff's office and the city manager. Um, many of the fun runs in the region have been canceled due to lack of availability of police officers to help line the route. Um, and we had more this year, perhaps, than we've had in the past. So um, the police and the sheriff and city manager were out there very helpful. And the funds that they raised will, uh, the Ed Foundation raised, will, of course, go to the super grants in our schools, um, teacher training grants, ESOL, and special education programs. And we want to thank, again, the Falls Church Ed Foundation. Um, something a little bit... Um, Different uh, tonight in the superintendent's report, um, I, I do want to let everyone know in the community that we do offer free menstrual supplies um, while available in our schools and all schools will have those um, menstrual supplies and uh, will be accessible to students and staff and I want to thank Kristen Michael and Brian Fowler, um, who've been working with a Meridian High School student Eva Williams, um, some of you might know Eva but Eva has been um, very um, involved in the process in selecting the supplies and the actual distribution method. Um, so all gender specific girl restrooms at Meridian High School, Henderson Middle School and Oak Street Elementary will have clear dispensers that will offer free and visible individually wrapped pads and tampons. Uh, those will also be um, available in the all gender restrooms too um, at, uh, at the schools. Uh, Mount Daniel and Jesse Thackeray will have similar distribution for the all gendered restrooms for the adults that are there. Um, but the big the big idea here is that we will have supplies available for our students and I'm very proud to have that um, availability. 
Um, mark your calendars. I think I said this before, October 2nd. It is homecoming weekend. Friday night is the football game. Saturday morning will be the tours of the schools beginning at 9 a.m. Uh, till noon. And then that evening is our homecoming, our homecoming dance. Um, so it should be a, a weekend filled with lots of fun activities and uh, hope you all can participate. Uh, and just lastly, just want to say thank you again for your uh, incredible support of us as schools, um, of the staff, uh, and, and of me personally. So um, it's been a, a pleasure and, and joy to work with you um, for the last four years and the next four going forward. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Dr. Nannan. All right. Next, we will move on to board and student liaison comments. And actually, why don't we start with Ariana, if you have anything? Um, yes, I have a lot, I guess. Uh, obviously, the school started this past few weeks and I just want to thank the board and everyone who was involved in making that happen because I think everyone in the schools were very excited to have a normal school year semi-normal back to school and it's just been amazing to be around students once again in an in-person environment and so I think just all the kids are getting back into the swing of things and excited for those more normal traditions like homecoming on October 2nd and the homecoming game on October 1st. I know the SCAs are planning for the pep rally and powder puff and volley boys and all those fun things for the upperclassmen as well. So I would just express my thanks to all the staff involved in the hard work that goes into keeping us safe and getting us back into schools. So thank you. Great, thank you so much, Ariana, and thanks for being here. All right, um, Mr. Henderson, do you have anything? Yes. Go ahead. All right. Oh, we're just doing if you have any reports from committees or anything. Um, yeah, um, it's, well, nothing pertaining to Fall Church City Schools, no. Uh, there is, um, this Saturday, a uh, program at uh, Justice High School, Justice Park across from the high school, where I will be speaking on the um, displacement of African Americans from that community um, through eminent domain. Uh, after the school was built in 1958, an all white school and uh, property was taken from African Americans, uh, two families to build the school, uh, but all of the area where the park was, was taken by eminent domain. Also, uh, I'm gonna miss homecoming because um, I have another speaking engagement at the um, James Lee Community Center unveiling the historic marker there, Fairfax County historic marker. Uh, but hopefully I can get away uh, and uh, take in some of the activities on the 2nd of October. Uh, that's basically all I have. Great. Thank you, Mr. Henderson. Uh, Dr. Jimmer. I don't have anything to report at this time. Great. Thank you, Mr. Reidinger. Yesterday, uh, I attended your DCAP meeting and I talked a little bit about that. I've got really nothing else to report. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Thank you, Trillin. I was uh, unable to attend this morning's chamber board meeting. Uh, there were some technical issues that cropped up, but I can relay that it was um, Sally Cole's last full chamber board meeting and her uh, successor, uh, whose name is just out of my head, Elise, whose last name I'm forgetting, and I apologize to her profusely for that, uh, was there for her first meeting. Um, so there's that. And then next week, I am attending the um, DSBA Legislative uh, Liaison Conference. Uh, I'll be going virtually, it's being held down in Richmond and virtually. And um, after that, I'll be interested to gather any uh, positions that anybody would like us to put together as part of our legislative package for the coming year. Uh, and then we'll be discussing that over the fall. So. Great. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Uh, Vice Chair Downs. Thank you, Chair Litton. A uh, couple of updates. Um, the Falls Church, as Peter, or Dr. Noonan said, excuse me, um, the Falls Church Education Foundation uh, met last night and just wanted to make sure everyone knew that 
um, the home and garden tour is coming up and that's on October 17th. And um, community members buy, uh, you buy tickets and you go through, um, I think we have five houses on the tour and all those proceeds go to um, the Education Foundation for future grants and support of our ESOL community. And then actually I sort of went out of order before that is um, September 29th is the golf scramble and that's another fundraiser um, and tickets are still on sale for that if you're if you're, if you're a big golfer so look that up on the Education Foundation website. Um, the Parks and Rec uh, board met last week or actually a couple days ago. Um, they were very complimentary of Ms. Michael and her staff. Uh, they said that the camps, the summer camps are a huge success. And it was a little challenging for them being at the high school, a brand new facility. And that's where Ms. Michael and her staff came in that they were just so helpful to the Parks and Rec uh, staff and helping them understand, you know, where things were in the high school. And so thank you, Ms. Michael, to you, to you and your team. Um, and I want to express thanks to Parks and Rec again for um, their help with giving, fund, um, hosting some camps during these holidays. Just earlier in, in the evening, we talked about the number of religious holidays in the calendar this year and um, our um, rec and park um, colleagues really came forward and, and presented some options and um, different camps and things for working parents during these holidays so that's been terrific uh, we also during um, the meeting talked about the fellows property which is the piece of, for people who don't know it's the piece of property across from oak street elementary and um, we sort of landed on three of the main areas looking um, how to use that piece of land, um, looking at urban gardening um, and a place where children can learn about natural resources and also doing some sort of like a natural play area. So um, that's um, still in discussion phases and I think they're gonna try to do a town hall on that in the future. And then finally, our Meridian uh, PTSA, um, they are looking to host all night grad back in the new high school. Uh, and uh, so poor Meridian will never be the same after that. Um, and so uh, look for that. And um, also on September 30th, there's going to be a joint meeting with all of the PTAs. And I believe Dr. Noonan is going to be making a presentation at that. So mark September 30th on your calendars. That's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Vice Chair Downs. Um, Dr. Ruiz Bolanos. Thank you, Chair Linton. Um, so from the FCE. FCE PTA um, meeting, they have just newly elected Mike Sakata as the president elect for the next year. Um, they are redoing their website. There are gonna, there's also a bunch of new gear, spirit gear on that everyone is able to purchase that they have um, invested in. And there are volunteer opportunities for parents if they want to sign up for committees or recess and lunch for helping out on Oak Street. And tonight was the info fair. Um, they also had an ice truck and they had a room parents meeting. And as uh, um, Downs, Vice Chair Downs mentioned, um, there's a joint PTA meeting on September 30th. And they will be also crafting some Zoom videos with the school board candidates with some questions and answers. And so look for, look for that to come. The Coral Boosters, they are hosting, or Meridian is hosting multi-school choir events. Um, their first event is a big thing, and there'll be local high and middle school choirs coming together. And the Coral Boosters will be supporting with personnel and snacks, and that is September 25th. They are also constructing a scholarship program to be awarded in 2022 to, to a 2022 graduate. Um, they're also having voice lessons return in person, and that would be vaccinated and masked singers and instructors. And then their first fundraiser is next week, September 23rd. It's at Tropical Smoothie Cafe. Please go there and mention the Coral Boosters so we can help fundraise. And then for the athletic boosters, as Vice Chair Downs mentioned as well, there's a Little City Scramble Golf Tournament and there are still tickets and that goes to benefit um, the Falls Church Education Foundation and the Bill Rose Athlete Assistance Fund as well. So thank you. Can Great. I add one thing? Oh, sure. Go ahead, Mr. Henderson. Okay. Uh, I just want to uh, give a shout out to the ribbon cutting and the opening of our fabulous new Mary Riley Styles Library. It is much more open and welcoming 
Um, the, uh, they have uh, meeting rooms there, which can accommodate uh, a lot more people. And my favorite, uh, the local history room is much expanded and has staff hours. And so I'm very excited about the new library uh, facility here in Falls Church City. Uh, Mr. Henderson, is there a birthday coming up on Friday? We might want to know about next Friday, the 23rd is my birthday. <laughs> oh, I was thinking about your no. grandmother this Friday. Oh, this Friday is my grand. Well, actually Saturday. But Mary Ellen Henderson's birthday is coming up <laughs> on Friday and there'll be right. a big Friday celebration at Mary Ellen. I was Henderson trying to give it to Bell's you, man. I'll, I'll be there with bells on and uh, I'll participate. I'll have to talk to uh, uh, Mr. Carey uh, is um, helping to facilitate that during lunch hours, one, 11 to 1. Great. We love to celebrate that birthday. So um, I just want to say thanks to all the board members. Um, I know there's been a lot going on as we get into the swing of things. Thanks for folks for coming out to convocation, people who did school tours on the first day, people who came out for run for the schools. Um, and I know committee meetings are heating back up. So just thanks to everybody for continuing to do all of those things. They're greatly appreciated. And just once again, a shout out to our, our staff and our teachers for a great start to school. We, we really are appreciative of that. All right. Oh, have, go ahead. I have one go back after Dr. Anderson. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Carolyn, may I have a quick go back on, on my report? You, you sure may. Go I ahead. I have reminded myself of the, of our, uh, the new executive director's name is Elise Bankston, and uh, she is on board and uh, succeeding Sally Colbert. Sally is remaining through the end of the month to help with the transition. So my apologies to Ms. Bankston for having her <laughs> name escape my brain. No worries. Great. Thank you for that. But Dr. Anderson, and go ahead, Dr. Anderson. Uh, my quick go back was, I just, I wasn't sure if the school board or the community knew, but we have um, entered into a lease agreement with Levine Music School for the temporary trailer over at uh, Oak Street. So in addition to sort of the comments that were being made earlier around the chorus, I just wanted to let you know that we've gotten into a partnership with Levine School and they will be offering um, for-profit music lessons and the like over um, in that in that space. So we're really excited to, to lease out to them um, a space that we weren't going to use anymore now that the library's moved out. Great. Thank you, Dr. Noonan. All right. Thank you to everybody for all of that. Um, next on our agenda, we have approval of minutes. Could I get a motion to approve the minutes? Can I say something before? Uh, sure, go ahead. Okay. I'm, I'm looking at these minutes and of course I was not there, but I can't tell anything that that took place from these minutes. Uh, is there another version of something or is there something else that I can see? Because um, the only thing I see, I, I don't see anything. I don't see any information at all in these minutes. I, I might be able to help you with that. It was only a closed meeting and it was an executive board closed meeting. So all that is actually is written is what uh, the reading <laughs> into the meeting and coming out of the meeting. Nothing is disclosed about the actual meeting because it was a okay. executive closed board meeting. So that is why there, I'll, I'll, we'll talk there's about no that. substance left to them. Thank you. I, we appreciate you reading the minutes, though. <laughs> Very impressive that you did that. Okay. Um, that makes Marty feel good. That yes. You know, people are reading it. Or Ms. Goodell, mm -hmm. sorry. My apologies. All right. Can we get a, a motion on the minutes? Uh, Dr. Dimmick, go ahead. I move that the school board approve the minutes of August 19, 2021, as presented. Thank you, Dr. Dimmick. Um, is there a second? Uh, Dr. Second. Thank you, Dr. Ruiz Palanos. Uh, Marty, can you okay. call the roll? Sure. Dr. Anderson? Yes. Dr. Dimmick? Yes. Ms. Downs? Yes. Mr. Henderson? Yes. Ms. Litton? Yes. Mr. Reitinger? Yes. And Dr. Ruiz Palanos? Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Goodell. Um, it looks like we have no materials for the board to review. And so with that, if there is nothing further, I believe we can adjourn. Did anybody have anything further? No. Nope. 
All right. So this meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.